Okay, good morning and good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to um, another session of the International Workshop on Environment, Sustainability and Education. My name is Oren Pizmoni Levy, and together with my colleague Daphna Gan from the Israeli Institute of Education for Sustainability at the Kibbutzim College, we are happy to welcome you to our final session of the workshop for season two for this academic year. If you are uh, new to our workshop and you would like to binge previous uh, sessions, I invite you to visit our YouTube channel. I'm going to put the links in the chat box right now, where you can find more resources about the workshop, recording, suggested readings, etc. Um, as I said, this is the final session for this year, but if you are interested in sharing your work at the workshop in the next season, season three, that will start in September 2022, please feel free to reach us. Uh, here is my email and Daphna's email. We will put it in the chat box as well. We still have a couple of available slots uh, for next year. Today's session uh, is with my friend and colleague, Danny Friedrich, titled Comics and the Expansion of Our Ecological Imagination. Danny Friedrich is an associate professor in the curriculum and teaching department at Teachers College. He's an expert not only in curriculum and theory, but also in the field of international comparative education and his regional expertise is in Latin America. I won't talk more about Danny, but I will just say that I'm excited and thrilled to have him here. We've been talking about this session for a long time and I can't wait for his um, inspiring talk. So Danny, the floor is yours. I'm going to stop sharing so you can take it from here. Hi everyone. Um, so like Lauren said, I'm Danny Friedrich. I'm really happy to talk to you today. Uh, I'm excited to share my presentation. I'm gonna talk for no more than 20 minutes and then we'll have a little bit of Q&A and I have a bit of an activity for us to do. I was talking to Eleanor and that it's summer. So at least here in the North, it's summer. So we should be having fun. We should be doing a bit things that, that engage our part of our, our, our intellectual lives. So um, I'm gonna start sharing my presentation and uh, we'll take it from there. You can all see it? I hope so. <laughs> yes. All right, great. So the first thing I should say is thank you, Oren, and, and the, for inviting me. Uh, I, I should say, like Oren um, mentioned, that I'm and my expertise in, is in curriculum studies and, and teacher education and international comparative education, but it's not on sustainability studies. So what I'm going to do is share with you some some thoughts I've had since Oren invited me, because I'm really interested in the conversation and what comes after in the Q and A as I'm working through some of these issues uh, through a medium that I deeply love. Uh, and I'm sometimes critical of, which is the medium of comics. But because you are not the usual audience that I talk to, I have to say a little bit about some of the grounding functions of my work that I've been doing on pop culture and curriculum for the past seven or eight years. I would say there are three pillars to this work. One is the idea that pop culture is curriculum. What I mean by that is the way in which pop culture is used in schools usually is how do we use pop culture to engage students to learn the standards, right? So how, how do you use Pokemon to teach math? And while that work is important, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm more interested in pop culture itself. So what is it teaching us? How, what are the teaching and learning relationships that happen when we engage in our effective relations to pop culture? How is the pop culture is communicating certain things and assisting others? What is the active engagement we have with, with the different varieties of pop culture? And within that, my work focuses mostly on visual culture. The second pillar is that I think we need to expand the conversation by using frameworks that allow us to look at different things around pop culture. Traditional sites of pop culture see it as, as these oppressive things from the empire that, that um, go into the passive masses to convince them to be a good capitalist. And while there was novel at the time, I think to look at post-humanist and effective frameworks, new materialisms, allow us to think more deeply about the active uh, engagement that we have with things that we love while they're problematic. You can hear me say this a lot, which is that we can love things that are problematic and we can engage them and, and understand them differently when we think about how is it that we love them? Why is it, what, that, what is that love doing to us? And finally, 
the third pillar is the idea that imagination is always a surplus to research. What I mean is that our work will never capture the whole phenomenon because each person engages with culture in an imaginative ways that always escape all the attempts to just freeze them in research products. So we need to understand this as a beginning of a conversation that will continue as each one of us engages with pop culture in different ways. And also when we think of how our students, when we think of K-12 education, engage with pop culture. Um, so why focus specifically on superhero comics? Comics is a medium. That means that any kind of story can be told through comics. Superhero comics is a genre within that medium. I'm interested in the very like mainstream commercial Marvel DC superhero comics because of several things. First, they're extremely popular. And what, what I'm interested in there is that they can reach audiences that research pieces that uh, traditional curriculum don't reach, right? Because people, again, fantasize all the time about it, different ages, different class, different nations. And, and so they, they have different relations with these products in ways that I think are very productive. I also think that superhero comics have a specific target in imagining the other than human, in imagining what happens when we suspend the limits of humanity and, and, and think of humanity in much broader terms, and also think of what is the non-human here, what is the other to humanity, in ways that for me are theoretically also very productive. Comics are inherently multimodal, that is they engage us through the visual, through the um, uh, sort of traditional literacy words and, and other things that allow different kinds of subjects to, to, to think of learning in different ways. And finally, I think it's central that we bring back joy to our research. I think that we tend to, especially when we talk about sustainability and other topics that are serious, that are important to take seriously, we can take something seriously while also holding space for joy. Uh, I, I, I've been trying to say for a while that joy is also a form of justice. So going straight into the, the topic of today, comics have existed, superhero comics have existed, are, are specifically American-based genre that have existed for over 80 years, right? And, and they are serialized genres that are issues that come every month, sometimes every two weeks, sometimes with the same characters that really age. And comics have a tendency to maintain the status quo. That is, the, the, the superheroes here usually fight these cosmic threats, these threats to the earth and everything, but rarely think about the systems, about the social systems that make certain core issues in society possible, right? Superman finds it easier to fight Brainiac or Lex Luthor than to think about poverty that you think about where the, the systems that are breaking down our planet's ecosystems, right? Be, in part because it's really hard to sustain radical change in a serialized format. Superman needs to fight every week or every month and Batman the same and, and the X-Men and all that. So it's really hard to make a radical change to society in those comics using those amazing powers and then sustain it in time in part also because these are extremely valuable commodities, right? So again, we can love something to be programmatic. Uh, radical change means the passage of time, but for superheroes, time rarely passes, right? Superman has been basically the same age for 80, 80 years, which means that notions like learning are hard to sustain there. Notions like radical change are hard to sustain. Every once in a while, some characters change a little bit, but then there's a reboot that brings them back to their blank slate, because also different writers want to take them on in their quote unquote purest forms. So it's really hard to think of these, these heroes using their amazing powers to change the status quo. There, there have been times in which some changes have been attempted. <clears throat> I have here two examples. Like on the left, you'll see a team called the Authority, which is a team of people with extraordinary powers who at some point says, we're tired of this crap, we're tired of, of governments ruining everything, so we're taking over. And they basically take over governments, they topple dictatorships and say, whoever wants to mess with their people has to deal with us, and they kill people and they, they, they quickly veer into fascism, right? That's one of the ways in which this becomes sustainable in the using of power to change structures. 
Um, the, the, the second example I have here is the idea of multiple Earths. Like most of the companies that we know for comics have different, have, have idea of a multiverse. And sometimes in those Earths, some structures change. There's an Earth in, in um, DC, for example, where there's no patriarchy, where the Amazons took over and most of the superheroes are female and there's a different dynamic, but those are like very self-contained separate stories that don't enter the mainstream of comics. They last for a few issues and they're left behind. We have some ecologically minded straight up superheroes here, right? So we have Aquaman, Storm and Vixen. They're the three, I, 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 some of them are more famous than others, but like Aquaman, Defender of the Seas, sometimes like there's an oil spill from a tanker and goes and, and chastises them and, and, and chase them down. There's people that contaminate and then he goes away, but, but he never thinks about, okay, where's the system here? That is, what is the capitalist framing here that allows this thing to happen? There's always the, the one of battles with this bad guy, but it's never more than that. Storm representing the earth and the, the natural forces of the weather, same here. And Vixen, who connects with the animals and the animal forces, also usually goes back to her native Africa to, to fight poachers and, 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 and those kind of battles. But there's not much thinking about. How do we use our powers to, to flip the script? In the 70s and 80s, there have been different characters that have been introduced that I want to talk about. First, I'm going to talk about some characters that, especially again in the 70s, were framed directly as villains, right? In this case, we have Rachel Gould, which are like they were called eco terrorists, people who thought that the earth was in danger, but the problem was human. So, therefore, the solution is to genocide or to, to, to turn humans into something else, to shut down all industry. So they were fought, they, they, they were fighting the heroes who were trying to protect humanity above all. And so the idea of something more radical came in the form of villains. And the other way in which some other heroes start to emerge were the anti-heroes, like in this case, Swamp Thing that I have the picture there, who are these like human nature hybrids who, who represent nature in a humanized form and that see humans as something to defend because they have to defend life, but not because humans are privileged. And usually those stories veer into body horror, veer into um, alternative stories more aimed at adults in which these are not clearly heroic, they're not framed as clearly heroic characters. They're framed more of like alternative views of justice, right? But that don't really, um, again, penetrate the mainstream comic as straight up heroes. And it's really interesting to think about why that is. But this, this, this talk was called Comes from the Expansion of Our Archaeological Imagination. So, where does the expansion come from? And, and this is part of what led Oren to contact me to talk about this is that I've seen in the last few years a movement towards something different in mainstream comics. And, and I can continue to say mainstream comics because in alternative comics, this has, all, that has been the case for a while, in sci-fi has been the world for a while, but in mainstream comics. I'm gonna talk about two different things. One is there's a different kind of action. Um, a few years ago, this new Superman was introduced first as Superboy, he's the son of the original Superman. Currently, the original Superman is off planet, so he asked his son, John, to take over. And he became very newsworthy because he came out as bisexual uh, a couple of uh, months ago. But also, he's taken on a different approach to the role of Superman. Superman is seen within DC Comics as the most inspiring hero. And he decided he's not going to use his powers to just punch bad guys. He really wants to address the system. Um, and so, in, in this issue, it will, while it was framed as like um, climate strike and all that, that's just the cover. There's a monster attacking um, Metropolis from the ocean, right? And him and the new Aquaman, who is there, have seen also a queer character, a, a queer of color character, um, decide to try to figure out why this monster is attacking Metropolis. So they, they figure out that there, his ecosystem in the bottom of the ocean was devastated. And so they try to address that and to convince the monster to go back and to work with them in re populating that ecosystem. So the monster is nonverbal, is is sort of non, it's, it's more of a creature, but they direct the monster, that's the attempt to direct the monster towards um, 
a peaceful solution that addresses the, the root causes of this. And, and this, this creates issues for, for Superman, who is basically seen as someone who doesn't want to fight for us by in his universe, the mainstream media. And so I cannot tell you how the story ends because it's an ongoing story about how he's going to use this, the role of Superman for something else. And this reflects this written in different areas. And also I want us to think about together maybe why is it much easier for characters to take on queer identities, for example, than to tackle climate change. And this is for me what's the most interesting thing that's happening right now. Um, there are, there's a different kind of character has emerged. Uh, I'm gonna, sorry if I nerd out for a second, but within the X-Men comics, there's been a, a, a truly radical change. The X-Men, uh, for those of you who don't know them, are this group of mutants within Marvel comics who have always been persecuted by uh, humans. Whether they were heroes or not, they were distrusted. They were, they emerged as a, as a basically, um, as a metaphor for racism and for fear of difference in the 60s. But they are born with these powers. They can't, they are not always pretty powers, right? And, and even though a group of them has always fought for humanity, the X-Men, the, the evil mutants that fought to they gain supremacy. But a couple of, of years ago, there was a radical change through different things in comics in which the mutants said, it is not working. It's not working for good ones, bad ones. So let's band together. Let's form a nation of mutants and let's just claim our own sovereignty. And the way they did it is there's an island called Krakoa who is a mutant in itself. So it's the first mutant that's not a human mutant, but it's an island that has sanctions, that has its own power, that can communicate verbally, but that where you plant, they grow certain flowers that when you plant them somewhere else, they can transport mutants back to the island. And so, all mutants are welcome in this island as the new mutant nation. The island can produce also particular flora that can be served as medicine to cure cancer, for example. So the mutants offer humanity, okay, if you want this cure for cancer, we'll give it for you for free, just don't touch it. Um, which creates the ire of many pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and there are certain other negotiating tactics that the mutants take on, sometimes violently, to defend their own sovereignty. But what's interesting here is the agency of the land, right? Krakoa as being a character, there's another mutant whose only power is the ability to understand any language, verbal or not. So he's sort of the mediator between Krakoa and the mutants. And Krakoa, who originally was created in the 70s as, a, as an enemy of the X-Men, as, as this giant humanized island, now is really there's no human nature to it, there's no eyes, no mouth, but it's just an, a, a land that feels. And the, the mutants know that the moment Krakoa falls, they fall. So they protect the land, the land protects them, and there's a mutual relation that allows us to imagine what would happen if some of the things that I think are inspired by the indigenous cosmologies are taken here literally to represent characters in ways that allow the reader to establish different, different relationships to the ecosystems and to this idea of the post-human, right? Of, of the other than human as having agency and affecting us in particular ways. So again, it's a story that continues. This has been, as, as I said before, comics are resistance to, to, to change challenging the status quo, but this has been within Marvel comics, a pretty radical change. And it's lasted for a couple of years. So I don't know whether it's going to be a reboot at some point, it's going to go back into normal um, or what. But it has forced every other character, even the non mutants, to acknowledge the difference, to acknowledge that what the mutants are doing is creating also a difference. So there's no capitalism within Krakoa, there is no um, representative government in the sense that we know it. And because of the different acknowledgement of the land, that everything else, every other system has changed in that particular nation. And other changing nations are paying attention. So I think that is maybe for me, some of the things that allow me to think of an expansion of, of the ecological imagination in different ways. So to conclude, I would say that traditional superheroes won't come here to save the day. They're not gonna save the environment. They're not gonna change in the real world much. But, the imagination of what lies beyond the human might open up different futures 
for us to think about and to enact different presence. Thank you. So this is the, the presentation I have. Here's, here's the credits for the, the template that I used and also for the art that was used in, that I took from different comics. There's a link to um, the latest book I co-edited with Stephen Corson and Julie Holman uh, from the Press. Um, and a series of readings that have inspired my thinking lately on these issues that I'm happy to share when I share the, I am happy to share the PowerPoint as well. So I'm going to stop sharing right now before we go into the um, Q&A, but I hope people have questions and we can talk about, like I said, it's not my area of expertise, but I just want to welcome the conversation. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, so as people are thinking about the questions, um, I invite you to raise your hand, your blue hand, or just uh, unmute and ask a question. But uh, Danny, I know, I know you're not you, you are not identifying as an expert in sustainability, but your talk connects really nicely to several other discussions we had here over the past two years. If it's about utopia, we had a couple of sessions on utopia. If it's about uh, imagining the post-human or the non-human piece in sustainability, this is great. So um, I'm really excited. I know I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to let other people ask first. Any question or comments? Uh, Jeanette, please. Hi, guys. Good morning. Um, I think the topic is very interesting, in particular, to approach to a young audience. Um, you know, at home, when we start trying to address the thing about the magical and fantasy thing, we start with uh, the mythology. And that's when we start seeing connections of all this, the mythology, the religion, and how now we land in the modern time with all these um, uh, American comics, no? And, and when we look at all these ideas that the imaginarium, the collective of the world is creating, it is fantastic, no? I, I don't know if, um, you know, the new, the new comic tendency, it's like uh, to try to address why the billions are the billions, why they turn into this, no? I don't know if, um, if at some point this work that he's doing, that uh, it's, it's going to connect how we ended up having all this climate crisis around and how we can fix it together. Um, uh, it's, it's very complex, the, the topic, no? But I don't know if at, at some point the, the work can, can, can reach that. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned mythology. I was thinking of this book here called Super God by Grant Morrison, who does a history of comics as our modern mythology. And it's really interesting, right? Sort of how the superheroes are, are the new gods of the pantheon and all that and, and how they work. Um, but I also think that what you're saying is true, which is like comics, like any form is evolving, it's moving, right? And they're moving away from the idea of black and white of villains and heroes. And they're trying to think more about how to make this more complex, right? Um, but also I think because they are a very, very valuable commodity for its corporations, that, that can only take you so far, right? Because they still wanna sell the lunchbox with Superman's logo. And they still want to sort of sell these products that, that, that are very marketable. For, for, for so, so that's sort of thing like there's this tension between challenging the status quo and evolving, but also want to keep certain things all the same. Like the fact that in most comics, the US is the place where most superheroes are. In those worlds, most superheroes are American. That's something that's rarely addressed in the comics themselves. And, and in part, I mean, it's something that's really interesting to think about the, the, the power imbalance around the country. Yeah. Thank you, Jeanette. Others? Uh, Oren, I will ask. Um, I'm thinking about the tension between uh, between comics and sustainability. So there is a tension there uh, in the um, 
uh, in the culture of um, power and money and, uh, and all this and the capitalism that we are trying to avoid and and, and we're trying to, to create a different culture. And now we're, we're saying, oh, let's use the culture of capitalism and say, okay, this is, a, this is good because it's popular, because it's a, we, we can use it for, for a sustainability, for climate change. So I wonder where is the line between our values and the medium that we're using? For me, it's about the last thing, which is it's a medium. A medium means it's a channel for telling any kind of story. That's one part, right? I think comics is just a medium. So right, the same with like science fiction, like we have a ton of books about, especially the current YA trends and like African futurism that think of ecology in radically different ways. They're just a medium to tell the kind of stories they want to tell. That's one part. And the other thing is if you, if you listen to how you are engaging with comics. There could be a message from the comic, but how they're appropriating it and making it their own is a different thing. And so, and that's what's interesting to me is that one of the reasons I tackle pop culture in curriculum is that in teacher education programs where I work, everyone has to take courses on developmental psychology. Everyone has to take courses on Piaget and Vygotsky and all that. But no one has to take courses on pop culture as if Learning about the universal mind told us more about who our students are than learning about what they are reading, what they are playing, what they are listening to. But we, if we learn, if we truly engage with this media, and then ask and listen to what youth are doing with it, that's where the power is, right? So they can take the Superman stories and then play in the playground and make radical changes to it, both in terms of queering the characters, in terms of queering the stories in terms of themselves asking, what, I'm, what would I do with this power? So I think that the medium is one thing that can tell any kind of story. But the interest for me is the medium as curriculum. And what is the learning and teaching is happening in that medium? So I don't think there's a clear line between our values and the medium, for me. Because the medium is just a medium. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne. Other questions or comments? Um, Miki, was that a hand up? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Um, I think that uh, the comics are the new graphic novels and they do tell a story, especially uh, Superman after World War II. Uh, he became the hero that had to find the, to save the world. And we really need uh, a hero like that today. And I also, Clark Kent is always like the intellectual scientist and he can't be superhero. So it has to be a uh, uh, you know, someone that's hidden and he's the superhero actually. And that's, I think that they can relate to that to children today. But uh, my question is how, how can the next generation see themselves uh, in your, um, how can they relate to a superhero um, if it's not just deflecting on something saying that uh, we can't solve our own problems. We need someone with superpowers who can save the environment. Um, I also saw in your presentation, you have the uh, son of Kalel. Kalel is Superman. So son of Kalel means the son of Superman. He's the one that's pro protesting. That's the next generation. Uh, so if we have a next generation of superheroes, are we the same Superman or are we gonna in invent something new? No. So, so you're taking out like the, the secret entity. It's super interesting because Superman um, revealed his secret entity to the world ten years ago. So there's like everyone knows that it's Clark Kent in the comics because in part he couldn't sustain that idea of duality, right? 
Um, but but I think that the idea of the new generations, so that's, that's the problem that comics have, is a problem of time. No one wants to buy, no one wants to sell us an old Superman, an old Batman, right? That's why those, those characters never age. So they're like very rarely do they have like very significant changes in, the, in their personal life, right? Superman married, but he's one of the very few characters that actually married and had a kid because the idea of change is very dangerous for the corporations that sell them. Who, who you can introduce new. So the way they did is magically, Superman's son was a, was a very little kid. He went on a time travel and came back a teenager because they can't allow for that time to actually pass in the comics, right? And so when you talk about new generations, that's one of the limits of, of the genre, of this particular genre, is that new generations have a really hard time. In, in the comics, have a really hard time growing up, right? So you have characters that are always very young, like teenagers. There are characters that are always young adults. There are characters that are always adults. And, and because time doesn't pass, it's hard to think of learning and change, um, which opens up other possibilities. It's not necessarily a negative. I'm just saying it opens also a possibility of like what happens when learning is suspended? What happens when you don't have to evolve and you can, you can stay in particular phases? It, it, I mean, it's it's interesting, and about you asked about how can youth identify themselves or feel um, reflected. Mm -hmm. I think it's it. I mean, not all characters are there to feel reflected in. Some are ideals. Some of them are like they 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 function in different ways. People are still buying comics and going to the movies about superheroes in massive numbers. So I'm not sure that that's necessarily a problem. Uh, I think we need to see them as, as complicated characters with very problematic aspects and also potentialities. Like all, of the, we can hold contradictory notions at the same time, right? Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Mickey, and thank you, Danny. I didn't know that uh, the secret is out. So Kent and Superman, everybody knows that it's the same person. Wow. Okay. Can't wait for that storyline in Wonder Woman. Um, which is my favorite um, superhero. But Danny, I have a question for you. It's two different questions. And um, I wonder what, what you have to say for many teachers or educators that are going to watch this recording later on or today are with us on the call. How can they use comics in their own work in schools? We're talking about K to 12 context. And second is we have other crowd here. We have people that are doing research in this area. What kind of uh, research is being done today around comics? I know you're doing a lot, but I'm guessing there is a community around you. So if you can give us a little bit of highlights on what's the new cutting edge questions that people are asking. All right, your first question was addressing what I said I would not do, which is how to use comics to teach things in K-12. But that there are different things. One is that one thing that people in literacy have been doing for a while is, is telling teachers comics are not a lesser form of literature, right? Sort of, I think teachers are tend to be afraid of like, well, if kids read comics, they're not going to read real, real literature. And comics are a wonderful way for people to get, for kids to get into reading and to use the, the art to engage a different part of their learning, right? So that, that's one aspect in which you can think like teaching literacy through comics, there's, there's a lot of work on that. Specifically about sustainability and all that, again, for me, for me, for my work and for the kind of things I do, is more than, it, it's asking kids. Like, so there's this wonderful trilogy called Binti by Nadia Korafor, a Nigerian American writer, right? Of African futurism. And so, Kids are already reading that, teenagers are already reading that in mass numbers. So asking them about it, not necessarily use like, I don't want that to be read in the classroom. Today we're gonna read only one chapter because that only works when kids are engaged in reading on their own page and all that. But asking kids any age, what are you reading? What are you playing with? What is it teaching you about the world? When it's something problematic, let's question it. When it's something that opens up possibilities, let's take that, right? But for me, that's the interesting thing. It's not how do we bring those things into the classroom to teach what I want, it's how do I use what they're already doing, right? To understand our students better. Who are they? The same way, I, what the work I do is, who am I, are we? Like, I, I look a lot at the pop culture we consume as kids. 
You think of images of teaching when we were growing up. How do we become teachers through the images of teachings we, we saw on movies and TV, right? How do we become subjects through the pop culture that we consume? And that's one of it. So that starts to get to your second question, right? But for me, one of the more interesting ways to think about pop culture is pop culture is producing subjectivities, right? And the dynamics between the production of particular kinds of subjectivities and pop culture you consume. Like, do parents go to school demanding certain things? because they see these inspirational teachers in TV? Or do we produce inspirational teachers in TV because people have experienced them on, on the school? Or is it a back and forth? Is there, a, is there a, a, a feedback loop there that's really interesting to look at, right? Um, that's one aspect. Another aspect that I'm really interested in research is, and that's the, the book that we co-edited, it's about how are we imagining the other than human? And what do we do with the other than human that we imagine? curricularly, right? Sort of um, people are looking at what other images of education show up in sci-fi that are not school-based. And can we do some of that? Can we think of that in different ways of teaching now in schools, right? Um, and what are the limits of that imagination too? Like how is it that it's impossible for us to imagine X or Y? That sounds, that sounds really interesting. Um, I think I see Jeanette has her hands up again. Jeanette, do you have another question? Yes, I'm, it's more like a comment. I really like uh, the last uh, thing that you address um, about how to teach. I just want to share with our uh, community this couple of, maybe you guys know these uh, comics books. It's about scientific things. And I really like them because the kind of, they are, uh, writing and how they are trying to address our our young students. Um, it's really good. The superhero here is a scientific, and it's not. Um, it's an African American scientist, and I really like how the the text is developed. And also, there are other books talking about what Dana was saying. Um, you know, Edward Wilson. They made this uh, book about his life, the naturalist. Um, and I really like it because it's also a comic, yeah? And you can deliver the message through the, like you were saying, like a, the comics is just a way to say it. And it can be also a very formal way. And maybe you know the, this guy who wrote the book, Sapiens, they also have it in comics, you know? And, and my son love it because that's a way that he now is learning all this um, real world um, by, by comics. And also we have it in, the real history, the, this is another one. Yeah, the story of the mom, um, of the world, sorry. It's in French. Um, and also it's in, in, in comics, no? And, and, I, and I see my son just passing pages and learning and enjoying all this kind of real literature, but transforming in comics. I, I think that's, that's not other, another way, not just this fantastic comics like a Batman, Superman, um, but that's my little two cents of uh, contribution to this. Like, I think Comic Land is something that the, the students really can enjoy a lot and learn a lot. I, I agree with you, Jeanette. I would add that Superman and Batman are real literature. Like, sort of that, that again, there's something we have to be careful with our own imposition of notions of learning, right? That you have to learn something serious in order to be worth your time. That there's a lot of learning that happens outside our purview that, that, that also, I don't think we need to do research about. What I'm saying is we need to respect. It's sort of like when kids do this kind of reading and, and playing and all that, there's a lot of learning happen, whether we feel as, of it as learning or not, whether we do research or not, whether it's serious or not. Like children have worthwhile worlds of their own that we need to, to, to take seriously. And sometimes taking them seriously is leaving them alone. Thank you, Jeanette, and thank you, Danny. Um, are there any other questions for Danny before we go to small group discussion? Okay, so we are going to work in four small groups. Danny created uh, for us a, a very uh, engaging activity, very good for summertime.
Danny, would you like to share the screen and give us um, some guidelines? Sure. So here's what I thought about, right? I think it would be interesting for different small groups to create a comic storyline. So not an actual comic that would take a long time, right? But imagine a storyline using either original characters that you imagine quickly or established ones, like again, Batman, Superman, the X-Men, Captain America, whatever, Wonder Woman, and think of what is the curriculum in your story, right? What relations of knowledge production exist in your story? How does the specific comic genre and the medium of comics contribute to that curriculum? Why would young people want to engage with it, right? If you, if you establish a story that is too lecture-y, right, that, that, that tells you the morals of the story, Yes, I'm not going to engage with it. So why would young people want to engage with it? And if you can, if you are artistically inclined, can you get a sense of the aesthetics of that comic? So that's, that's the idea. I'm not sure we're going to all get to everything, but we just need to think about how are the ideas that you already bring to this conversation about ecological imagination, our sustainability, would you be able to trans, like, translate that into a comic storyline? OK. Any question for Danny about the, this um, assignment or task? That sounds really cool. OK, so we are going to work in small, in four small groups. Um, it's now 9.45 my time. We'll spend 25 minutes on this, and then we'll come back to uh, share our um, comic story. Here we go. So here we go. Danny, I'll, I'll let you facilitate. All right, so group one, what did you talk about? Let me show us a little bit <laughs> what you did. Uh, we, okay, so we thought about uh, making a comic where addressing to uh, young kids, like uh, elementary school, uh, and we thought about um, taking subject that is really close to the kids, something that they can, they are, they always can see and they can uh, relate to the problem. So we thought about a character that is, uh, it's an animal, a sea turtle, a really old sea turtle, uh, that is coming out of the sea. There is kids, two kids or some kids next to the sea. Uh, and then there is a sea turtle coming out all covered with plastic bags and dirt and it's look, it's look like a plastic monster and it's calling the kids and they don't know uh, they don't know who is what is it and they think oh it's a plastic monster and then they come in closer and he tell, he's telling them I'm not a plastic monster I'm a sea turtle and he can tell them about the future because he's living for a long long time and it tells them how it was many years ago before the plastic was invest, um, in, invented. 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 Um, and then he's asking uh, for their, uh, their help and, uh, and they go back to their school or kindergarten and telling all the other kids and um, asking the, asking them to join them to this uh, action. And then the end of the story is that they are coming with all of the kids from their school to the beach uh, to clean it and to clean the reef maybe. Uh, and you want to add something, Laura, Jeanette? No, I just thought, you know that they we would relate we decided to there's going to be a really cute turtle you know an old with his son with his glasses on the tip of his nose and maybe a cane and just something uh cute that they would make them smile and relate to yeah and it, it was very interesting to to design this in this uh short time and i'd like it uh how we start seeing the potential and you know, explaining the problem, uh, making a plan and take it action and make all the kids like a superheroes instead of take just one individual um, member, like uh, make them, empower them that they can do something, yeah? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tim. 
Does anyone have a question or a comment for group number one? Or in. So the whole storyline will be from the perspective of the Teltel? Am I getting it correctly? It's a good question. I think in a comic, uh, there is no uh, one perspective because uh, you read the all characters um, bubble speaking um, thoughts. So you can see all of the characters' um, perspectives. But you envision him or her, the Teltel, it? being the, um, the, the, the main he character. Will, he will like be- Like the narrator. It, the, the turtle will be the, the, main. the main character at the beginning, but then after, uh, after the, he tells the problem, then the kids becomes the, the main character because they are doing the action and they're becoming the heroes actually. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I want to save my comments to talking about all of them together. So I, I want to have time for everyone to present. Uh, what, what about group number two? What did you discuss? Uh, hi. We, a new light stuff is Rhyme and Lit, okay? As a, a, we have this book and we, we're based, based our uh, comics on it. It's called uh, Echo Velogi, if you know it, Echo and Logic. It's an ecologic story for uh, little kids. And our um, characters, we have two characters that, that they are like little uh, Shedonim. Oh. Leprechauns. No? Elves, yeah, little elves. Uh, one is a uh, male and the other is a female, so both the uh, boys and girls can uh, relate to. Um, and they uh, find they make they make the way uh, for uh, the kids, the children, uh, to understand how to take care of the environment. And if, uh, I'll show you. There's, you see it? They're uh, very nice and uh, very uh, smiley and they care of the environment and they find out that uh, someone just uh, somehow destroys it and they think it's a monster, but they find out it's themselves. And they help the children that uh, listen to it or uh, know it, the story, uh, to think about the way they behave to the environment, their own small environment. No, we're, we don't want to talk about the whole uh, world now, just the environment they know that surrounds us. Uh, and to ask questions, what do we do? Should we pick flowers? Should we throw the garbage? Should we... Um, separate uh, the garbage or this kind of story, okay? Is it uh, more or less understood? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Any comments or questions for group one or two? All right, group number three. What what do you think of group number three? Are we number three? I don't know. I love that. Group three was uh, Amal, Lilach, Otal, and Rita. Oh, so we, we I spoke as room number two. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so who was number two? <laughs> you're muted, you're muted. Yeah, uh, Catherine, Lewis, and Mickey. Okay. Catherine, please. No, Lewis should, because he, <laughs> okay. he came up with the, you know, the main theme. 
okay uh yeah so i think we came up with a storyline is about um this uh uh, a group of the children and the one leaders and she has a superpower can decarbonize uh, all the plastic uh, they can collect so but the superhero need to uh, leading need, need to collect all the plastic uh, uh, guiding to the classmate to help help her and collect all the plastic from different parts of the world and then she can use her superpower to decarbonize everything and then turn into the green energy you know back to the world so um yeah so uh, i think the bad guy in this story will be plastic so uh all over the world so um i think that's that's what our story is <laughs> does that make sense he's also in uh, high school so our audience high school, is, uh, right. high school students. Any questions for this group? Hmm? All right, and the final group? Hello, I guess we were the final group. Uh, with Ella and and oh, I cannot see. I, and, uh, uh, okay, and so Tommy. yes, so uh, actually we didn't get to create a story, a plot with characters. I think we started with that, but we sort of moved on. Um, oh yeah, Tommy, I can see Tommy. Yes, uh, uh, we started talking about. The, the the medium, how powerful it can be, uh, whether it is a comic um, or a story or a digital story or a movie. Uh, we refer to some of the you know Disney movies and other movies that have characters that are insects and other uh, animals. We did highlight how uh, the, the powerfulness of that medium lies with the fact that it can help teachers um, mediate discussions uh, around potentially difficult issues and topics like activism. It's one thing to talk to students about pollution or recycling and why it is good or how you do it, but how do you talk about activism? And so addressing the question about the contribution to, uh, to uh, you, the contribution when you use a story or a comic could be to help towards higher order thinking skills like criticality, which cannot happen from, you know, in one session or from one point to the, uh, to the next, and hopefully help, help learners, whether children or adults, start forming questions and questions that can go, as Daniel said in his presentation, on beyond than human which can be very difficult for anyone to, you know, visualize or think and, you know, and, and articulate. Uh, um, so we've talked mostly around the, you know, as I, as I said, the power of the medium. Tammy, I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, I, I would like to add that we thought that, um, we thought that because this tool as, as, um, this media as a teaching tool is not so obvious uh, for children and also for, for teachers. It can make uh, the children, the students feel more natural and more, um, um, it, can, it can make, it can give them the, um, the feeling that it, it's okay to ask the questions. I mean, if, if this tool is not so obvious, and it is used uh, in class. So it's all, also okay to ask questions that, that are not obvious to ask and to enlighten subjects that are not usually talked about. And another thing that we talked about, um, that it can be a good tool, a good media to connect subjects uh, with one another. Uh, like I thought I gave the, um, um, I saw uh, the movie of Ari Fulman, uh, the new movie, Where is Anna? And he connects in the movie the subjects 
the story of Anna. Um, he, he does give some details about her story, about uh, where she, were, uh, she was hiding and a little bit about her family and how she felt and she um, comes out from the diary and gets into the diary. Um, but at the end of the story in the movie, he connects her condition to the condition of immigrants um, these years. And um, it's like, it's not obvious. It's not in Israel uh, to talk like this. It's not so, um, you cannot say it aloud, uh, um, it, uh, so loud. Not everybody will just talk to you about this uh, subjects together and when you put it in, in in pictures or in comics it's allowed because it pictures because it's 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 a different media then it is more easy to talk about it to connect these subjects thank you and, and I think what you just said has captured some of the things I was thinking as I was listening to your your idea right which is, I, I'm sorry, I always keep talking about tensions, but, but there's a tension between our need to teach something and also our need to resist always thinking that we have, the, we have to be clear about the lessons that kids need to learn, right? So do we always need to tell, tell kids what to do and how to solve the problems? Or do we trust them to present them with a complex problem for them to come up with solutions we haven't thought about before? And this goes to any age. It's not only for older kids. Right. Um, I was thinking of, I mean, this is the typical discussion that people have in sustainability, right? Sort of, yeah, we can clean up the beach, but this is address what made the beach dirty in the first place. Let's address what, what we do with the garbage later. Does it just make the beach prettier? Uh, but also we want kids to feel empowered, right? We want kids to feel like they have something to do, but maybe kids, I mean, it's hard to figure out what they need to do, right? And so I do think that, that some of the, the more radical comics allows us to, to imagine different things that don't have a clear application in the present of what to do. But it, it, it implies a trust in people to read complex things. And people here, I mean, any person, to read complex things, complex ideas, complex, complex worlds, and try to come up with themselves with what they need to do. So the educator role is not always the one that tells people how to behave, even though sometimes we have that impulse. Sometimes that impulse needs to be kept in check with the trust on the other. Thank you, Danny, and thank you everybody for engaging. Danny, can you say a little bit more about your, I think it was your first or second point about this urge we have to educate or to teach with this. And what, what's the, um, I'm trying to better understand the argument about the possibilities that pop culture or comics open to us when we try to confront this urge to educate or like to be very intentional. Right. This. I don't know if you all are my same age group, right? But in the 80s, it was very fashionable in kids' cartoons for the cartoon to end with the characters talking to the camera and telling what you had learned from this episode. I remember He-Man saying that like, this episode, we learned that friends are the most important thing to, like, whatever. It's like, so every, there was always a moral at the end of the story, right? If you think about that as a teacher, as a teacher taking that role, when the teacher takes on that role, it also forecloses the possibility that someone might have learned something completely different by connecting their own imagination to what they just saw, right? I think teachers are so used to always wrapping up with a lesson, with, and this is what you should take out of. This is the objective and tools, like this is what you should do with it. And I think that at some, in some moments that is important, by many others, it's also important to not give that last lesson, and to try to figure out what people actually did learn from it. What did people get from it by connecting their own imaginations to what, that which they engage with? And so teaching can also be an act of listening. It's not always an act of talking. 
right? It's not always an act of telling people what to do with this. Again, even in very early grades. Great. I think that's a wonderful point to stop. Um, Danny, thank you so much for engaging us with uh, something that we, I don't think we, we, we talked about this kind of medium or way of thinking uh, so far. So thank you so much, that was great. And thank you everybody for engaging with the um, uh, task. And thank you everybody for joining us for the second season. I, many of you came again and again, and it was wonderful to see your face every month. We're going to take a break in July and August, and we'll be back in September with season three. And if you have any ideas for speakers or any ideas you want us to um, engage with next year, just let us know. We're more than happy to coordinate this. Thank you so much, Daphna, for another wonderful year. Oh, and I just want to say one sentence that I'm a, a very proud of my students. Many of my students are here today and I'm proud of you that you are talking in English and you are uh, present your ideas and uh, I'm very happy about that. I know it's very hard and um, I hope you will join our sessions next uh, year uh, volu voluntarily not just uh, when you have to. <laughs> okay, everybody, have a wonderful summer. We'll thank see you. Bye-bye. We'll wonderful summer. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you. Bye, Danny. Thank you so much. Thank you.